All right, we've made it. Well done. And we didn't lose anyone, I hope, from the parts from upstairs to downstairs. All right, so welcome, welcome to today's lecture, second part of the Deep Learning 2 course on the specialization of self supervised envisioned language learning. I hope you can see this well. Um, gonna start with some organizational bits. Um, I've re-recorded the first lecture um, because in the second part of the recording, the slides were missing. And so I've, while doing the re recording, I added some more details as well. Um, yeah, everyone should know which team they're on and who their TA is. Uh, if you're doing the project in this module, <clears throat> and I hope you enjoy the work um, because now is the fun part. And yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, all right, just some caveat again this week. There's just so much uh, going on in this field and there has been a lot of research in this field as well. So what we're going to be walking through today's lecture is just a tiny snippet of that basically. But I'm gonna start with a quick recap from last, last week. So we went through a couple of self-supervised pre-training methods which use different kinds of techniques that work on a single modality like images or language. Then we went into multimodal learning where we had these models that can, for example, align two modalities by having two encoders, that's something like clip or align. And we also talked about uh, architectures like COCA, which do captioning um, and contrastive learning. And then we went into further methods that uh, apply captioning, but for example, also uh, have a retrieval token, if you remember. Um, then we explored a bit of what of things that you can do by treating GPT as a as an oracle, so something like Socratic models and teach text and this other paper which asked a model uh, asked GPT how can I visually identify these kinds of birds, etc. Then we looked at into lo longer context, and with that we looked in also a bit into what kind of tasks we had. Um, I've heard that there were a couple of questions with the, in the tutorial about uh, few short learning. So I just wanted to bring this up here one more time because this is what we'll be talking a lot more today, this in-context learning ability. So what I've had the last time is um, this slide that this sort of ability to do few short learning within a single forward pass comes up in these large language models as an emergent ability. And what this means, we'll, we'll dive into today. But just on this point, did anybody have some questions from last time? All right, if not, then we'll continue. This is also one of the slides that I've added. So this was um, about how visual language models basically can, can retrieve images in quotation marks. Um, I've added this sort of logic here to it, where basically the main gist of it is that everything gets encoded into a language token or language tokens. And the language model in turn can return a retrieval token, which means, okay, it's it's trying to retrieve an image. And if a retrieval token is part of the dictionary, it simply means I want to return an image, but then how do you find the corresponding image? You do that by then looking at the embedding space that's just before you return this token. This token is simply just a word, right? So you don't know which image. Instead, you look into that token and then you have a linear projection and that's how you actually get the correct image. And that's that retrieval is just a contrastive learning term. So I think last time I didn't say that particularly clearly. Um, but yeah, that way this fromage model can, can basically have the ability to even return images when, when being asked for it. Of course, it was trained exactly in this manner. So it's not like it was trained on just vision captions and then suddenly it can do that, but rather it was trained to exactly do that because of you. it was trained to return this image image uh, retrieval token after, uh, after outputting a caption. All right, and then we jumped into this frozen model, which is now multimodal few shot learning. So multimodal in context learning with those cherry picked examples and this sort of architecture where they have a completely frozen language model and simply train a visual encoder uh, based on this autoregressive captioning task. All right, any questions? Great. So then we'll go to in context learning. Um, 
common misconception that all magpies love shiny things. Some of us don't care about precious metals or, at all. Hank, just admitted that you lost. So I couldn't find anything better about context, but we'll talk about what we know about in-context learning, what it ma why it matters, and what kind of, especially in-context learning for multimodal abilities we have. All right, so visual vision language in context learning. So this is another example from the frozen paper. So in this case, I hope you can see it. Um, what you see at the top, you have images of lions and huskies. And then you have, um, first of all, you have this task reduction thing, answer with dax obliquid. Dax obliquid, these are nouns. They, are, they sound like nouns or they are nouns, but they don't have an inherent meaning. They're certainly not lion or husky, right? And then you provide this model basically these few examples. In this case, just like before, you encode the image into the vision encoder, then you get some tokens out. Two tokens, actually. You pretend like they're language tokens. At the same time, you take the caption, you embed them, so you have language tokens, and you simply put all of these together into the language model. And then you give it the final one, the final image, you embed it, get the tokens, and add the question. And then you let the uh, language model output what it would output next. And then it answers, for example, like it. Um, in this case, or you would, if these were instead, this is a lion, this is a husky, this is a lion, this is a husky, and then you would expect it to answer, this is a lion. The reason why they've replaced here lion with Likert and husky with Dax is because strangely it works better um, than using the real names, but we'll go into this uh, in a bit. Um, the same for VQA. You can, for example, ask um, what is the what is the DAX made of, or the, in this case, what is the uh, vase made of, and then it would reply, for example, wood um, or table, I guess. Um, and here, the ICL basically stands for something like open-ended vision language few shot evaluation, right? Evaluation. Well, we'll go into the bits first. So open-ended because it needs to infer what to do and what the answer style is. So it, it's not like you're giving it five options where it can choose between wood, stone, and plastic, but instead it needs to infer that. And it could, because it's a language model, it could output anything. So we call this open-ended. Well, vision language, because it needs to process both the image and the text information. Um, otherwise it cannot answer, answer any of these questions, right? Especially because, I mean, this is now the very simplest way where you have two-way classification, <laughs> kind of. Um, and of course, the order is not fixed. Like the previous to last image could easily have been a lion as well. And then it wouldn't know what to answer if it doesn't look at the images. Few shot, yeah. So in this case, as you can see, as always, the green stuff, those are the, the few shot samples. We call them support set because they are the labels, basically. That's how how you tell the model what what this task is and how this task is solved, basically. Um, and people have called this also fast binding ability because you need to associate the label and the image, which are just provided within a batch. And it's not like they are separated, right? They're all just one, all of this input is just one large sentence in a way that you give to the, to the language model. And it needs to infer basically that these, this, this caption, which could be, say, 10 tokens long, refers to this image that comes before. And this next caption, which is, say, just five tokens long, refers to that image that comes before and so on. And so the model basically in this forward pass needs to be able to do that in order to solve the task. Yep. Yeah. Can you kind of is there a training part to this, or is it just purely in context of probably some setup that this information is done? Like if you reset kind of like a window and then you start off again, does it still retain this information about this threading? Um, so this is uh, just evaluation. So this is literally, you have your pre-trained model and then you do this in a forward pass. So yeah, if you put it through the same thing again, you would get the same results. Um, of course, you could train for this as well. Then you have some sort of few short learning pipeline. Um, and we're actually working on something related at the moment. And that's in this case. But yeah, this idea that... Um, in context learning emerges in large models. 
we've talked about for GPT-3 and we've also talked about very briefly in these other models like Blip and Fromage and, uh, and Frozen. Yeah, and so uh, we're sort of diving in a bit deeper of what in-context learning is in visual la vision language learning. And then, and then we'll also look into a couple of papers that have analyzed actually how this in-context learning works because it's just a forward pass. How can it be learning anything basically? All right, so, right. So here you can see now a few tables from, from the frozen paper. Uh, they look complicated, but they're not particularly complicated. So the first uh, row simply means task induction where it needs to figure out what it's supposed to do. And then these inner shots are how many support samples you give it per, per class. And on the left-hand side, you have uh, two-way classification. And on the right-hand side, I think it was five-way classification, yes. Um, and then you can see the performance of Frozen, just this model where it uses words like lion and husky and dog and cat and so on. Um, this data set has 20 different categories versus um, that's the one with the real names versus the one where you use those fake names of Dax and Blicket. And you can see here that the fake names work better, which is quite quite interesting. Um, and can like, yeah, might, might motivate you to think a bit because it is strange. The frozen model was basically trained to be captioning. So it should benefit from, yeah, this information that this is a lion because it sort of knows, has seen a lot of these examples. Um, but yeah, it apparently does not. And this is quite an interesting thing. You can ask Ivona and Muhammad what why they think this isn't the case. This is like one of the motivations of our current research. Um, it's not the case for the uh, visual question answering data set. However, you get still a non-zero performance of this. All right. Um, so now we talk a bit about in-context learning. And what people say, and of course what is also quite often in the news, we'll get to that a bit later, um, is that in-context learning emerges um, in large language models with scale. So what does emerge, emerging mean? So one one, said, uh, one quote that has been used in, in science is uh, something is emergent or an ability is emergent if it is not present in smaller models, but it is present in larger models. And or you can say emergence is when a quantitative change in a system results in a qualitative change in behavior. So you could you can say anything like okay you put a couple of uh, you put a couple of uranium molecules together, each one individually doesn't do much, but at some point you have something that's completely different from from how a single single uh, uranium uh, atom behaves, right? So it's some sort of uh, zero to one change. And it's not quite a zero to one in these cases, but in these plots, which all show different tasks, for example, uh, where you need to answer a Q and A, where you uh, need to unscramble a word, and all of these sort of language related tasks. And on the X axis, you can see the model scale, as in like how much flops were used for training. And you can sort of see that it, at some point, it doesn't seem to be working at all until it suddenly does. Um, I mean, this is a logarithmic scale, so it's not quite as sudden, but it definitely has a unique shape to it that isn't, yeah, that has the sort of emergent look to it. Um, and why or how these abilities emerge is, of course, like a really important question at the moment. Um, there's a couple of reasons why people think uh, this behavior can happen. So some problems definitely require memorizing. For example, this truthful QA asks you to answer questions about facts. And yeah, you can only learn so much if you have only limited number of parameters. If you have enough parameters, you can probably learn Wikipedia by heart, just stored in the parameters essentially. But if you simply don't have enough weight, it has no way of solving this task. So for some things, memory is important, but you see the same behavior for, for example, simple math problems like addition or uh, uh, continuing a series for which you definitely don't need to store that much. Um, so this doesn't explain it uh, fully, at least. Um, another thing is also that um, like some sort of caveat to all of this is that these evaluations are very strict. Um, 
may, for example, care only about exact string matching. So if the model returns a panda, in this case, for example, it would be correct. If it returns a panda bear, you would say it's wrong. And so it, it's sort of a, like not very generous metric quite often in, in uh, natural language processing. But of course, this also doesn't really explain it. So actually, it's not really clear at all why this happens. And of course, like maybe you can figure it out. That would be pretty great. Um, I would recommend this paper. It reads quite quite well. And similarly, this talk from Jason Way, uh, who's sort of this guru in, in this field a bit, um, works at Google and has, of course, access to large language models. All right. Um, then I'm not sure, has anyone seen this thing about, uh, there was an interview with a popular TV show with Google's uh, CEO. And then they also interviewed an engineer who was part of that. And so one of the claims was, yeah, one AI program spoke in a foreign language was never trained to you know. This mysterious behavior called emergent properties has been happening where AI unexpectedly teaches itself a new skill. Um, so my... <laughs> The reaction of mine and of a lot of other researchers on the internet was kind of like, what's what, <laughs> like what's going on here? This this clearly is just wrong. Like it's not like you give the model data and it suddenly figures out a new language, right? That's not that's not how AI really works. Um, and then it turns out so apparently the model wasn't trained on Bengali, but then suddenly if you give it a task in Bengali can answer it in Bengali. And so the real reason is basically they didn't know what they were training on and there's definitely Bengali in the data set. Um, but yeah, it's it's easy to complain about this sort of stuff um, about media's blowing up expectations and also CEOs doing that. Um, but the question is sort of why does this keep happening? Um, so my two cents would be here because this kind of... In interesting and this will keep on happening so i thought i'd add a slide here so one is of course that deep learning industry is increasingly about marketing as you can probably see from any new paper that comes out of the big companies it has a shiny web page an amazing demo everything um at the same time quite often they are not sharing code anymore not sharing models anymore depending on the company so you can see it's it's increasingly um in industry it's increasingly about money um the ai research um, that they can apply to products and so on. So this also makes, yeah, motivates you to have very high, maybe exaggerating claims about what, they are, what your AI can do or whether it's sentient, um, which reminds me that there's, there was, uh, which I read from this uh, tweet from uh, Melanie Mitchell, where she analyzed a bit this interview. And so Google CEO said, um, when, when asked like, uh, so these AI models are black boxes, um, so which we do not understand, right? And then Google CEO said, yes, but I mean, we don't understand humans fully either, right? And then the conversation kept on going. And so it's this subtle shift and we're not talking about the system. And then when you say something like, okay, we, we don't understand humans, it really tries to humanize the system as if it's already sentient. And so the way this whole debate is being framed is actually quite quite interesting. Um, and yeah, of course, companies don't really have an incentive to document and analyze or properly figure out where the training data is from. If they did that and it's somewhere written that OpenAI uses data they shouldn't be using, then they that's gonna look bad, right? Um, all right, um, so moving back, so, <laughs> in context learning in vision language models. So why is this still impressive? Um, because especially some of these small, well, well, Flamingo, okay. So Flamingo, um, if you remember, that was trained on these web pages with interleaved text and images. So kind of like Wikipedia pages and all of that stuff. So in models like Flamingo, you can sort of expect in context learning to be simply part of the training data. So if it sees enough web pages where there's text and then a related image and then more uh, text that then relates to the image and so on, you can sort of expect this behavior to be 
simply part of the training data. So you, of course, you, you'll be able to text, uh, test it. Um, but these other models like uh, Frozen, for example, which was simply trained on captioning, did never see during training more than one image, right? So why can it even solve these tasks even? I mean, if you remember, like, for example, the the numbers that they had for two-way classif open-ended classification were something like 50%, which, I mean, if you think about two-way classification, the least you can do is 50%. But then, of course, you need to keep in mind that it's open-ended. So technically, the least you can do is 0% because it's not given the options between Dax and Blicket. It needs to actually write the sentence Dax and Blicket. Um, so that's why if you get 54% on two-way classification, it is definitely higher than chance, basically. Um, right. So, so then, for example, if we remember the frozen model, we know that it has never seen these multiple images in a single input. So how can it do that? Well, it relies on the ability from the language models. And that's why we'll, we're increasingly starting to look at papers from the NLP domain and try to understand what these language models can give us. And that's what we'll be doing now as well. All right, any questions? I'm sure they'll come. Right. There's this paper called Larger Language Models Do in Context Learning Differently, again, from this Jason Way guy from Google. And I hope you can read this. This is a typical in context learning task, right? So you have some sort of three examples, for example, like contains no wit and label negative, very good viewing, label positive, a smile on your face. And then the model is supposed to output, well, that's positive. In this case, for example, sentiment prediction of sentences. Um, then Sorry. And then what you can do is flip label in context learning. So now you simply switch the label. So now you say contains no width, positive, very good viewing, negative. And so you let you basically define switch the labels, yeah, and let the model figure out, oh, now you've switched the labels. Now I'm trying to, or now I need to uh, output something which during training at least wasn't associated with that. So how flexible it tests how flexible the model is, how how much you can override it and how much abstraction there is. Because if it was, if it sees a sentence like very good viewing, it's very much in the weights to just say that's positive, right? But if you want the model to do something completely different, you can test it by an experiment like this, by seeing, okay, how much does it actually follow my instructions? Um, similar to uh, semantically unrelated ICL, this is pretty much the, the idea from Frozen, right? So now, you're saying you're mapping positive to the word foo, uh, negative to the word foo, and positive to the word bar. Um, typical sort of words used in programming, but you can simili similarly use DAX and Blicket. So that's exactly the same what they did here, um, except that in the frozen paper, what I showed you as a single slide was just like one paragraph in their paper, more or less. Um, but they, in this paper, they actually studied this as their main contribution. Um, and right, what they find, let me see. they what they find is basically that the larger the model, the more it has the ability to do flipped label ICL and so ICL. Um, that's what they find. They again like take all the language models, and again, this is only in the language space, so there's a lot to do for vision language, but they do that in the language space and they show that more the model becomes bigger the more it, it's able to do this uh, correctly and follow the instructions, except for GPT-3. Um, and then they write, for this reason, we consider all GPT-3 models to be small models because they all behave similar to each other in this way, which is quite funny coming from a Google model saying that, oh, GPT-3 is a small model because it doesn't behave the way we want it to behave, which is really strange. Um, and they also write, this ability to override prior knowledge with input label mappings only appears in large models. We conclude that it is an emergent phenomenon unlocked by model scaling, and then they cite themselves. Um, but clearly it's not present in every large model because GPT-3 is definitely a large model, has a lot of emergent abilities. So, so yeah, maybe this theory isn't as solid as it is. I mean, the, the empirical evidence for a lot of large language models seems 
to point in that direction but if gpt3 doesn't obey by this do you simply like remove this data point such that all the data fits your theory or do you adjust the theory um so yeah new ideas are definitely needed i think yes in this case uh, the sentiment classification is a known task i mean yeah saying there is a, 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 a about it that we know we are trying to create between these two classes of data but if you're trying to give it abstract sentences that don't make sense but we want to find make it give different Mm -hmm. right so yeah you're right that the training data probably contains a lot of uh yeah sentiment analysis tasks or sentiment related things right um you could come up with your own task right and where you're sort of sure that the model hasn't seen that and see how it performs on that but on the other hand you need to make the task sort of understandable that the model gets what you're trying to do. So I'm not sure exactly. But, but, but I think what we are, want to look at is for the emergent properties that we're looking at mm -hmm. is its ability to do an unknown classification between two forms of text. In this case, it happens to be sentiment. Differentiate between sentiment between of content in two Yeah, things. yeah. So let's, if we can create like this as an abstract term that is not very explicitly like sentiment classification, but some differences in text, maybe mm -hmm. add some other class text classification of, yeah. of category or something like that. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's, and they, they have a couple of other examples as well. So maybe sentiment is too easy in that sense. However, sentiment and understanding or, or for example, translation, these sort of examples are very much in context learning examples where the, the longer you make the content, the more you have this sort of as, as an input, the better it performs. So in this case, this does make sense to use something like, like a, a task where the more you put in, the better it gets, because that's sort of the definition of in-context learning. Um, but yeah, maybe there's, there's different task as well. Man. That, that could be interesting. Any other questions? All right. So, oh yeah, and this of course, um, Getting the getting the ribbon because this is simply analyzing a bunch of language models, no training, no, no, yeah, pretty pretty good for the GPUs. All right, another paper which sort of tries to understand um, in context learning, and the title is "General Purpose in Context Learning by Meta Learning Transformers," and what it tries to figure out is. Well, one of the messages is that in context learning is basically a learning to learn algorithm. So what they do is the following. They have this architecture here, which is a, at the top, you can see a simple transformer and it outputs these labels, Y1, Y2, Y3. And now what you, um, what you input is uh, simply these pairs of X1, Y1, X2, X, Y2, X3. And uh, X1 is a data point, for example, an MNIST as a vector, or later they also try a cipher um, where they use an image embedding. And then they simply transform these pairs and then put it into a transformer and then let it figure out uh, what comes out at the end. And it's trying to predict the correct class. So in this case, uh, yeah, you can see the third support set and it needs to predict the third query set in this case. Uh, so X3 is the input in this case, and it needs to output Y3. Um, and so you can train that with all kinds of combination, right? So MNIST has 10 sort of digits, and depending on the size of the inputs that you put in, so you can either put in 20 of these, 50 of these, depend. that basically makes up your support set size. And then you have a bunch of combinations. So every time you, like it's a combinatorial space of how much how many samples you have and how you construct these samples and how many classes there are in you can either have nine different classes here in MNIST or you can just use two and alternate them more often and all of these things and so you can construct a lot of classes so it goes up to two to the twenty four and you can see that the performance on the scene tasks so things that occurred during the training data and uh, during the training sort of gradually starts to improve um, from two to the eight tasks, basically, that's a blue curve. Um, however, the performance of unseen tasks, for example, where you are provided with this sort of samples in, in the context and then need to predict that sample, which wasn't in the training data, 
um, still remains at, at pretty much 0% until you reach a point where the, this model architecture has seen enough points and they call this the stage where the model is learning, has learned how to learn basically. And at that point, it suddenly has solved the task basically. At that point, it can see any sort of combination and it solves it with the maximum accuracy it can in this case somewhere around 60%. And furthermore, if you take this sort of architecture and then simply change the image embedding from an MNIST to a fashion MNIST input, which is quite different. Fashion MNIST sort of contains bags and clothes and so on. It's, it's uh, still just a, a single channel input, but still it contains more classes. It's very different. It still obtains like very non-negligible performance. So what this means is that this general in-purpose, in-context learning transformer, I'm really hard to pronounce, but this model has now learned how to take these image, take these pairs and associate them, create associations between them in order to solve this task, what, for example, the X3 belongs to. And you can train this model even on something like MNIST, where this making these sort of associations is pretty easy. And then it performs even like decently on fashion MNIST. And they also test this on Cypher, um, which is quite a, yeah, interesting thing. And of course, working on MNIST and so on. Again, this is one of the papers which doesn't require much GPU. All right, another paper which studies in context learning um, as a learning to learn algorithm and makes this now way more explicit is, is uh, the paper by Kirschedal. Um, I think this one, is it? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, all right, so again, we have, what do we have here? All right, so in this case, they, and these two papers came out simultaneously, so they sort of have similar results um, where you can see that the performance um, is not only important the number of tasks that we just saw in the plot, but also the state size of the transformer. Um, in this case, the state size is sort of the hidden dimensionality you have in a transformer. And they show that uh, the performance is much more correlated to the state size and also for other models as well, like LSTMs, and they uh, try out a couple of architectures, um, much more important than the number of parameters. So I haven't shown the plot here, but if you simply have number of parameters, you don't have this nice curve. You, you have some sort of bottoming out. The more parameters you have, it doesn't necessarily improve the performance for this, but rather what's really important is a transformer state size because that's sort of how the transformer can associate uh, individual items inside the batch with other items. So if that's not big enough, it can cannot solve this task. Um, and yeah, they, they also show it can generalize to other data sets, for example, you have the performance with uh, on Cypher 10. And in this case, they're not operating directly on uh, on pixels, of course, um, but rather use feature embeddings. So they put the images like Cypher, they train on, on MNIST, or they that's what they call, they meta train on MNIST, this sort of architecture. Um, and then they test it on Cypher. And actually, I think these two papers, yeah, they were the same paper, actually. I wrongly said they were two different ones. The next paper is a different paper now. So this paper now came out at the same time, uh, roughly, and now uh, basically makes the analogy from in-context learning, implementing stochastic gradient descent, essentially, within conducting a single step of stochastic gradient descent. So what they do is you have stochastic gradient descent on the left, where you have your neural network, you have your weights, and if you do one backward step in gradient descent, that's your gradient with regards to the weights of the loss on your training data set. And you do that, and then you get uh, roughly uh, the y pass out, so that's the prediction you want to get. And they do this uh, sort of analogy here to a transformer getting this context and query, and this also yielding the same output. An important or the interesting plot is on the right, where you can see, for example, the loss with gradient descent steps sort of decreasing. That's that's quite typical. But for and now the, the analogy they're taking is that for a train transformer, you have the same but with transformer layers. So basically, the deeper you go, each layer basically does one step of gradient descent. It's sort of main roughly their their message here. Um, 
So in this case, what they say is that the autoregressive training, so if you remember lang large language models tr trained autoregressively to simply predict the next word, corresponds here to this outer meta training loop where, um, where meta training, I'm not sure whether we've covered it a lot in deep learning one, I don't think so. Meta learning is basically all about finding a good network initialization from which you then take one step. So in this case, you're trying to find not this typical timing or whatever initialization, but you're trying to find an initialization from which you then only need say 10 samples and take 10 gradients decent steps in order to get to a really good model. So in a way, um, for example, self-supervised learning is something similar because it gives you a really good uh, initialization of the neural networks, but there's more adapted ways. For example, if you know exactly, you will be tested on five-way classification for these sort of images. You can, of course, train in a manner that is better prepared for this final task. That, that's pretty much the summary of meta-learning. Um, and so in this case, you, you can see that the meta-learning would take um, steps with regards to different uh, losses. So for example, loss in terms of animal few-shot classification, loss in terms of basic few-shot classification. And all of these would take you in very different directions. And then you try to arrive at a point from which you can then take your typical uh, gradient descent step. So meta learning involves basically, yeah, being one level higher than that. Um, and what they are saying is that the autoregressive learning corresponds to this meta learning where you're finding an initialization from which you can then fine tune easily. And what is this fine tuning that's happening easily? That's the in context learning. And they provide some uh, empirical evidence for that. What they write is transformers learn to learn by gradient descent based on the context. That's sort of the main message. And they also show that for the linear regression case, sort of depending on the noise, what ICL is doing is ordinarily squares or rich regression. Um, so it's actually literally implementing an, a well-known algorithm. Um, so yeah, these papers both came out very recently and sort of try to better understand what ICL is doing. Um, of course, these are working on very much toy problems, um, linear, linear regression, for example. Um, but still, for these very small models, there's still a lot to explore. It's basically, yeah, like this is, this is how we are sort of understanding this whole in-context learning and transformers view. Um, so there's a bunch of things to do. Any questions here? Apart from things I cannot answer, but all right. So then um, I would ask you to turn to your neighbor and briefly explain the core idea behind in-context learning. And perhaps you can talk about what the core principles and ideas are and what you find very intuitive and what you don't find intuitive at all. Okay. All right. And maybe you can join your neighbors over there. All right. All right. How's it going? Yeah. How many how many new questions came up? Any what what do you find very unintuitive? Unclear. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> or different mm -hmm. point. Between yes, good point. So mm -hmm. in a way, few shot learning as it was typically done, and it was mainly done in computer vision, is where you take your model and you adapt it to doing the few shot learning task. What you're now doing is you're not taking any gradient descent steps at all. Instead, you're doing everything within a context, within this context. Mm -hmm. Moreover, you sort of have your model, and then this model can do few short learning tasks and all, all kinds of few short learning tasks. So you're not, that's also related to this meta learning idea, basically. Your model can do all of these things without being specialized. Yeah. But yeah, what people also call this few short in context learning. So, yeah. Yes. In regarding to this meta learning, but there is no actual gradient step, right? You just 
you're in a general area where it can solve a bunch of tasks yeah. and you prompt it in the right way, but it doesn't go down the loss curve anymore. The parameters don't get adjusted anymore. Parameters don't get adjusted, yes. But if you, I mean, a transformer is sort of the same thing at every layer. So you could, in theory, try to get the output in words at the first layer, at the second layer, and so on. At which point you would see that the loss gradually decreases per layer, uh, which is, I mean, you have something like that in vision as well. Like the deeper you go, the better it gets. So you kind of have that. So the loss does go down the deeper you go without adjusting the weight. Which is itself not very surprising. Like if you took K nearest neighbors um, on a CNN and you look at it from at the features after conv one versus conv two and so on and deeper and deeper, and KNN also has a loss function or like how wrong the classification is, you would also see that it gets better the deeper you go. But that yeah. But what they're saying is sort of that um, training autoregressively is sort of mathematically, and I haven't read the theory in too much detail, um, equivalent to doing meta learn, which is very interesting. That just predicting the next work is what actually makes for something really, really general. So if you're interested, I, I would recommend reading that. Yes? Uh, I to understand the difference between meta learning and, I mean, I know it kind of feels like there's an overlap, but what I'm trying to say in meta learning, we're going to get a lot of tasks, a lot of different kinds of tasks in the context, or is that what we do, or is it something different? So meta learning typically doesn't have context. So context, we usually use now as a word for like language models and so on. In meta learning, you're trying to get to a neural network initialization that can then solve a lot of different tasks. Um, are you in one of the projects here? So ask Ivona, she's an expert in meta learning. Um, was there another question here? Yeah, yeah. so um, how does the industry use the uh, income tax learning to the Uh, well, short answer is I'm not sure. Um, I mean, ChatGPT kind of does that. So, I mean, it does a lot more, but in a way that's what it does. And so what it's not quite 100% clear how ChatGPT, for example, is implemented, but you simply have a chat history and that you can refer to other stuff that happened earlier on and you can write like, no, I meant it this way. It's simply by simply concatenating all the output that you've got so far and putting it as the input before. And then now you add your new question to that. And so all of that before is basically the context. And at some point, you the, like the length that the transformer can handle will be too much. And then you can try to like distill these into just a few things. That's how like memories are implemented in transformers. But for most cases, you can have a pretty large context length and that way, you have all the chat history in the in chat GPT in the GPT model, and it can refer to all of these things. So that would be one way. Yes. In one here they talk about the state size of the mm -hmm. um, of the transformer and something about how it freezes across batches or so. If I you said that wrong, please correct me. I didn't quite understand it. Does the transformer really see across different data samples or what was learning within? Yeah, and I I don't think I meant to say with across batches. So okay, you, because you can do just a single batch yeah. inference, um, and typically samples inside a batch are typically not used for across. Yeah. But, um, what exactly was that then? Did it use like a, the the state size? Yeah. Why was it important for that task? Mm, they write that this is the the capability. Like this is required for do for doing in context learning. Like I mean, you can just treat it as an empirical observation, but also like this is the part that can that learns how to map this label to this image and so on. So if that's not good enough, yeah, that that I would explain it that way. Yeah. Yes. If I'm understanding this right, as we train the model, the model learns uh, different regression techniques. In the saturation rates. Um. Yes. Yes. Or well, like not explicitly, but implicitly. That's yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. It 
depending on what kind of data you're training on in these toy samples, you can find common algorithms like ordinary least squares regression or ridge regression in the transformers weights, okay, basically so implemented in the weights. Yeah. The weights implement regression, not a gradient descent. They so the weights implement can implement regression. That's one paper. The other paper says um in context learning actually does gradient descent. Well, gradient descent is another learning algorithm, basically. Uh, ordinary least squares, you can do this thing with a pseudo inverse of the data and so on. So you get like one thing out, right? And you find the ordinary least squares regression uh, equation and you find the weights. In gradient descent, you can also solve a linear uh, regression problem, but you solve it differently where you take a loss and you take a step towards a better solution. So these are two learning algorithms, right? Kind of very different learning algorithms, but one paper says it can do that and another paper says it can, it can also do that. So yeah, transformers are learning to learn algorithms and they can implement a couple of well-known learning algorithms, sort of the summary. What else it can do? I don't know. <laughs> the part about it implementing stochastic gradient descent is a little bit unintuitive. I agree. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it wouldn't be stochastic but in this case because you're just dealing with a single sample. Um, yeah, yeah. I, maybe we can dive into the de detail a bit later. Um, I'll I'll finish the slides. Um, or like go go through a bit more slides and then we can. All right. So. All right. So now we will go into chain of thought reasoning. Um. Right. So first of all, I, it's probably too small for you. So I'll read it. So this thing about chain of thought reasoning. So here you have on the left it just normal few shot past. Roger has five tennis ball balls. He buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each can has three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have now? And then there's an answer, and then there's another question, and then the model is supposed to answer, and it answers it wrong, for example. And um, now what you can do here is uh, you can add something called chain of thought uh, reasoning. Um, and what you simply add to the context here is this point about, okay, five plus six equals 11. Therefore the answer is 11. That, that's the thing you add in this example. So you, you give it a one more step in between. That's why it's called like chat, uh, chain of thought. And then what you find, or like what people have found is that then you look at the model output and it does it correctly a lot more of the time. Um, of course, for that, for that, you need this additional input of five plus six equals 11. So you need, these sort of samples like humans writing five plus six equals 11, which is a bit annoying. So what people then came up with is called zero shot chain of thought uh, reasoning, which is simply adding this let's think step by step. Maybe you've seen it um, on the internet as well, but you simply add that to the query and then your model absolutely magically performs way better. So what you can see here is um, the blue lines are chain of thought prompting and green lines are just regular prompting. And you can see that, for example, for large models like Lambda, GPT, and Palm, especially once you go to large scale, the differences are huge. So a task that the model previously could not solve at all, you just add, let's think step by step, and it suddenly performs way, way, way better. Um, extremely <laughs> surprising. Um, uh, for example, here, yeah. For example, in arithmetic, in GSMK data sets, which sort of test school level things, simply adding this let's think step by step thing. And that's a very, like, they call it zero shot COT, but all they do is this basically improves the performance by an insane amount, um, which is really, really interesting. And of course, it doesn't come from anywhere, right? It's, it sort of has seen a lot of internet data where, like, this sort of arguing is used to go through problems from Stack Overflow to Quora to all of these things, uh, which are heavily inside these data sets. So it's not like this comes from nowhere. It's not like you can invent something like that, that easily, but you can sort of dig it out of these models, which is, yeah, what people have been doing. Um, there's another paper which sort of tries to take the idea of um, chain of thought reasoning into vision language models. 
Um, in this case, you you basically have a model which first um, outputs the rationale for how you might get to the answer and then tries to then answer the problem. So in this case, you need problems, obviously, which require vision and text because we're in this domain. And then you have this one model which generates a rationale and this other model which generates the answer. But of course, in this case, you need, first of all, the rationale. Like you need a model that you train to generate the rationale and only then can you generate the answer. So both in this case, there's just one data set which sort of has images and text and the corresponding rationale, which is called science, uh, science VQ or something like that. Um, so in this case, you simply do supervised fine tuning, which isn't all that exciting, but it shows that if you train a model to generate this rationale first and then provide the answer, it works better. So still pretty interesting, but yeah, this is now, as you can see, like, okay, two papers here from 2022, the rest are from 2023. So like this, yeah, is very much, uh, uh, current research. And I think some, some people here are also working on, on similar ideas in their projects. Um, all right. This you can do in the break. Let's take a break until 20 past so 10, 10 minutes. All right. All right. Amazing. What can we do with this? <laughs> All right, let's continue. So let's continue. So we'll continue with vision language data sets. Um, so vision language data sets that we use nowadays, what does it mean? <laughs> they have images and they typically have captions. And in this case, you can see what happens if you look in a popular data set for the term French cat and you find indeed some French looking cat. So you would have thought that maybe, maybe there's an image that would fit the description, but that there's so many images, it's it's astonishing. And the fact is that the data set that lots of people use nowadays, for example, for training stable diffusion, for training versions of flip models, for training versions of uh, flamingo models and all of that, that data set now contains, uh, yeah, 5 billion images, 5 billion image text pairs. Um, and it's, let's start on the left-hand side. It's constructed by basically a dump of the internet. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a data set called common crawl. That's uh, a data set generated from uh, a nonprofit organization, which basically tries to preserve the internet. And then based on this openly accessible data, they applied clip-based filtering. So they use the clip model to figure out image text pairs, which, uh, which actually fit. So that the text below the image actually fits the image description. Then they try to filter for not safe for work and for watermarked images. And then they achieve these sort of different data sets. For example, uh, Lion 400 million, that was the original one, which mainly contains English image text pairs. Then you have uh, Lion 5 billion, which is sort of the biggest version yet. They have a subversion called Lion Aesthetics, which contains aesthetically pleasing images. So something like professional photograph looking things. So for example, stable diffusion quite often, if I remember correctly, is trained first on Lion 5 billion. And then the last steps are sort of uh, done on Lion Aesthetics because Aesthetics is a smaller data set, but you sort of want the stuff that comes out of stable diffusion to look nice. Um, right, there's another version of, actually we go to that one, on the next slide. Um, but of course, this data set being simply scraped off the internet has a lot of issues. For example, there was a new headline artist finds private medical record photos and popular AI training data set. How it got there, who knows? Uh, is it okay? No. Um, you can explore all of these images here. Actually, you can also, uh, that's the official site they have. You can also, um, let's see. You can also request to have images removed on, on that website as well. Um, but where's my mouse? Online. Right, so what this does is basically it 
does a clean nearest neighbors look up in their image embeddings? Um, all right. Any search term? That's not French cat. What's that? Something. Oh, I, well, let's see what comes up. Okay. Could be correct, maybe, but um and yeah, you can like I'm not gonna do this here, but you can like check for like not like that it also outputs uh not safe for work images that are I think still in the data set. Um and it's like but even if you type in like very innocuous things, mm -hmm. the data quality you get is can be extremely bad. So I I find this very interesting to to look at what kind of data these models have been trained on. And this is, yeah, we can type in my names. Let's see what happens. Okay. Yeah, and here you definitely don't wanna press this button. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, all right, sorry for that. Um, all right. Um, right. You can you can do this later. Uh, let's let's just finish the slides. Um, let's do this at the end. Actually, this will be good. Um, there's another data set commonly used, especially in academia, called conceptual captions. Um, there exist two versions of it: three million and twelve million. In the uh, three million version. So, as you remember from the line paper. A lot of this stuff is about cleaning the data sets because a lot of the stuff you find on the internet is too noisy. So even though deep learning can deal with some noise, um, a lot of research shows that if your data set is a lot cleaner, you simply get better performance. Um, a recent paper that came out last week or so um, that I also just talked about in the break is called Dino V2, which is scaling up the Dino self-supervised learning method um, in terms of a couple of hacks and techniques and then finally also training it on a hundred times bigger data set than before. But importantly, this data set was curated to be very clean, to not have duplicates and so on. And so this idea of simply taking a huge data set, cleaning it, and then training on these is of course better in terms of you need less uh, GPUs, better for the environment, and actually achieves remarkable performances. So that's why these sort of cleaning recipes are quite, quite good. Um, these are the ones that they've used in this case. So for example, a unique word ratio covering various uh, point of uh, point of what? point of sentence uh, text, so like verb, uh, object, and so on, um, which you can get automatically. Uh, if something repeats a lot, uh, that's not good. If capitalization is uh, always or like well applied, that's a good indicator. Remove not safe for work, all of that stuff. Uh, you only arrive at 3% remaining images. And then you can further filter with, for example, a supervised image classifier. And then in this case of the CC3 million, you further replace hypernyms. For example, if it if it says here, um, Demi Lovato wearing a black Easter Abner spring, blah, 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 gown, you change it to pop rock artist because if you only have, only have 3 million pairs, there's no way you can learn individual names for example in the cc 12 million they they change that back to leave leave that the way it is for example uh if there was an image here saying like uh a nice bridge in amsterdam in the cc 3 million data set they would have a nice bridge in in a city uh, or something while in cc 12 million or lion they would simply have the caption as it is this data set came out uh less than two weeks ago um is basically the version an attempt at duplicating the data set that flamingo was trained on so this like interleave um images with text so in this case you have for example a sentence um get a step ahead with the planning for your team and get all the votes you need for the next season and then you have an image of a boat and then you have a similarity score whether this sentence belongs to this image or not um this is pretty much the data set uh, what you can download is all the text and then you have links to the images. So these are all just JSON files and you would have to download the images yourself. But it's a pretty, pretty large data set. Um, 
and they apply all kinds of filters to it. And reading this stuff is actually pretty interesting. All right, now we go to the adaptation methods. So that's you. And of course, that big block is a large language model or a large model. And adaptation models are these things, basically. All right, so I hope you remember this from Deep Learning 1. There's an approach. You pre-train your model, and then you fine-tune it. All fine-tune all the weights with some loss. The loss is computed with the outputs of your model and some target labels. All good. You have also limited fine-tuning, for example, where you simply train a linear probe or a fully connected layer. That's the only thing that you fine tune. That's why it gets the fire emoji while you keep the uh, main part of the model frozen. That's also pretty easy to understand. Of course, you can also take the model completely frozen. In this case, you simply get all the embeddings out, for example, store them in some database, and then you can cluster this, these embeddings and try to figure out um, when you get a new instance to which cluster does it belong to, or you can try to find nearest neighbors. So that's sort of the retrieval setting that you can also use in vision and language settings. Um, all of these are good ways of using the models, but especially with the advent of the transformer architecture, we have new ways. Um, so one is called adapters. This was actually also present in, in ConfNets, where you basically learn very low parameterized uh, modules that you insert into a model. So in this case, you visualize by these red stripes. Um, these could be, for example, learning a mask that masks out certain parts of the weights uh, in your MLP, for example, or one by one convolutions. Um, MLPs, which are implemented in a residual manner, such that when you initialize them into a pre trained network, they shouldn't have any effect because if you initialize them randomly, they're just going to destroy everything, right? If your model is already working, you want to use an adapter which initializes as like not having an effect. And then only then by fine tuning that it should further improve it. Um, but people have also shown that, for example, only adjusting the batch norm or only the bias parameters also has a, has a very positive effect on fine tuning. So you're not adapting all of the weights. So you're still getting the stability and robustness you get from these weights. You're not having catastrophic forgetting or anything like that. You're not trying to get huge uh, updates on the parameters, but it still adjusts to the target training distribution. This other thing, which we've briefly covered um, in Deep Learning 1, is this prompt or prefix learning, where you basically have your data and you learn additional inputs. Um, and these additional inputs could be visual, like the one we had in the assignment in Deep Learning 1, um, but they could be all kinds of things. Um, it's And it's in a way, it's similar to adding something like step-by-step, -step, or if you uh, use uh, stable diffusion, things like uh, trending on art station makes every image basically look nicer. Um, except that here you're not trying to find real words for it, but instead you're just learning these factors and you're learning these factors simply by gradient descent because uh, you have a loss function and then you can simply backprop towards these inputs and these inputs don't need to be words. They can simply be uh, the vectors, right? So we'll go into some examples here. So this was a very, very, very original way of uh, using adapters. In this case, it was used for confnets. So you had one pre-trained confnet, and now you wanted it <clears throat> wanted to fine tune it for a couple of different tasks without adjusting all of the weights for it every time. And so what they simply did is they took the uh, they simply added a one by one convolution to this. So one by one convolution. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you can have at every layer. And so you have a couple of adapters this way. <clears throat> and you simply let these adapters fine tune themselves to the target training data set. Same happened in NLP, where basically you have this sort of adapter, where, well, this is just a transformer block. Now what you're adapting is A, the layer norm parameters, and B, you're adding this sort of adapter structure to it. The adapter structure itself has this sort of bottleneck structure. So you have your incoming feature representations, let's say, which is uh, six dimensional. Then you have a linear layer, which projected just into two dimensions, then some ReLU or some nonlinearity, and then you project it back into the original dimension. And here you can also see the uh, residual nature to it. So basically, at first, you only, the path can go through here, so the adapter doesn't have any effect. 
but you have this nonlinear nature to it um, that can adapt. And furthermore, because you have this bottleneck structure, it really doesn't have a lot of parameters. So if you remember why we like one by one chromatics in deep learning one, this saves you a lot of parameters. So if instead you had like a fully connected layer going from here to here, that would require a lot more parameters. While if you have a bottleneck structure like this, you simply have this sort of addition of these two linear layers, which is much more efficient. And they show that um, adapters are extremely efficient in terms of number of tradable parameters, um, much more efficient than fine tuning, for example, the top layers, um, which would be sort of the generalization of this linear probing idea. All right, um, positive is, uh, of course, doesn't require much memory, is very expressive, very performant, actually learns faster than fully fine tuning as well. Um, but it does add inference time. So you're basically inserting new modules to your, to your method. Right, then we have LoRa, um, where here, just one reminder from Deep Learning One, where we had this idea of real data lying on the lower dimensional manifold and the enhanced mapping from this RGB space gradually to this more semantic space. And LoRa is sort of motivated by this idea, plus another empirical observation. So what LoRa does is you start with a normal fully connected layer, like W0 being the weights and H being the hidden representation. And with what you simply do is you learn another matrix or you learn another addition, additional two matrices B and A, and which simply get multiplied also uh, basically another fully connected layer and you simply add that to the weights. So in this case, you're ke keeping W0 frozen. So this part doesn't change. You're simply learning B times A. And if B times A is for example, initialized to be zero or to be outputting something very little, then you also have no adaptation. Um, and what, you, what this paper now do does is it says B and A, um, should be low rank. What does low rank mean? It's kind of like uh, an outer product of two vectors, right? If you have two vectors, you do an out outer product, you get a matrix out. And this matrix will only have rank one. Um, and you can generalize this to have, for example, uh, rank five or rank six or whatever. And the same happens if you multiply these matrices. So B time, if B is a low rank or a very tall matrix basically, and A is a very wide matrix, and you multiply these together, you get this big matrix out, but it will have a rank which is limited by the initial ranks um, because you have this formula, which also makes sense. You cannot really generate information. So the rank of a matrix product is a minimum of the ranks that you have uh, initially. Um, the reason they do that, apart from this idea that the data sort of lies on this lower dimensional manifold, um, is that actually there's an empirical observation that the bigger the transformer is, the more their weights actually are also on a lower dimensional manifold. So actually their weights um, have a much lower dimensionality than they would have. So for example, if even though if the state size or the hidden dimensional uh, hidden dimension is like 15,000, actually all of the weights, you could do PCA basically, and you would arrive at just 60. And what they also find is that the bigger the bigger the transformer size, the lower this hidden dimensionality is actually. So what this means is if the weights are only on this sort of lower dimensional manifold anyways, then of course the adaptation only needs to happen in that manifold as well. And you might not know this manifold, but you can learn and you learn it by simply having two flexible matrices B and A. Um, so there's absolutely no need for, for basically replacing B times A with a whole new matrix W dash, because that would be completely wasteful. You don't need to adjust in 16,000 dimensions. You only need to adjust in those 60 dimensions, which really matter. And how do you find those 60? You, you simply learn them basically like this. Um, and you can also implement this in a very easy way. Um, and after training, you can simply fuse it with the original weights, right? Because now you have your W0 and your B times A. You simply add them together, and now you have your new weights, and you can store them easily. Um, all right. So in LoRa, 
which I just explained, and hopefully this gives you a bit more time to think about, you have these two matrices A and B, uh, even though they are only used as A times B, right? Um, so why? Is it one, learning two easy linear transformations is easier than one complicated one? Two, enforcing low rankness by a singular value decomposition is expensive. Three, by allowing A and B to be square sized, we obtain more optimized matrix multipliers. Four, actually, rather than two linear layers, a single bigger one would also do it. It's a lot of text, so I'll give you one minute. All right, so let's let's check the answers. So on the, at the count of three, I want to see the fingers. One, two, three, or four. One, two, three, go. So one, 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 two, 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 between two and one, and some unsure answers. All right, so one not is I would say not quite quite as true. Um, Two is correct. Um, number three doesn't really apply here because uh, we don't want A and B to be square sized because then it would be quite expensive, right? If A and B needs to be square sized, we're exactly learning all of the parameters, which is not what we want. And I don't think many people said that. Um, rather than learning two single layers, one bigger layer would also do it. Is um, not quite true, you would have to have a bigger layer and sort of enforce structure on it. So now let's uh, take a look into why one and two are important. Do you see any whiteboard pens here? No. Right. Um... <laughs> All right, let's try something then, annotate. Let's see, um, draw, okay. Right. So, all right. So the way a linear layer, the way A and B is implemented is the following. So you have one linear layer, which gets, um, which gets one dimensionality in. So let's say it goes from the bottom to the top, right? It gets a dimensionality D in, and then it projects it into a lower dimensionality A. And then you have a matrix B, which then goes from A back to D. So basically, if you write this into PyTorch, you have torch.nn linear, 100, and then 10. And then you have torch.linear, 10, 200. Um, and obviously, these are two linear combinations. So technically, you could make them into one linear matrix multiply, but then you wouldn't have this. Um, nice structure of low rankness. So how you implement this is simply by having these two linear layers. And that way you sort of enforce it to be low rank and very efficient in terms of parameters. Um, so yeah, if you do that, you know exactly that the result will be low rank. If you want to enforce low rankness, otherwise you can have your big matrix, you can compute the singular value decomposition, and then you can enforce that the singular values are very, or the uh, L1 norm of the singular vary values is very low. That would work, but singular value decompositions are very expensive. So if you want to regularize by rank, this is a very easy way to do it. Of course, here you need to sort of predefine the rank that you have by saying basically this hidden layers dimensionality that tells you exactly what rank you're adapting to. So it's not super flexible, but you can simply try multiple things like rank six, rank five, rank 10, um, these sort of things. Um, so this is a very, very cheap way of learning a matrix, which is low rank. Um, yeah, and 
and number one is pretty much equivalent. So learning two, yeah, learning two linear transformations is easier, easier to train than one complicated one. In a way, it's equivalent to two if if you would have trained that other linear transformation in a way that still enforces the low rank. Yes. <clears throat> Are there any questions to this? Yes. So it's basically enforcing low rank through bottleneck. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Where's my mouse? All right. Oh, no. <laughs> uh huh. Clear. 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 I don't want to erase manually. I'm good. All right. <laughs> Great. Clear all my drawings. Okay. Right. So then we're at this other stage, prompt learning now. Um, right. So I'll keep this relatively brief. So as I've said, like you can either, um, yeah, this is your transformer. You can simply add additional prompts. So these are just learnable vectors in this case. And you can add them, for example, at only the beginning. That's sort of very similar to what we did in the assignment. Or you can add new learnable prompts at every layer. Of course, then you simply don't, you simply, instead of having P prompts, you have N times P prompts. Um, but this gives you, of course, much more flexibility. Because if you just learn these learnable prompts at the beginning, you're sort of relying it to be, transformed in a good way such that they still have an effect at the end. Um, so instead you can simply learn prompts per layer and then another paper shows that actually you only need to do this for the very last few layers. So you can be even more efficient than that. Um, yeah, prefixes are just learnable vectors. Um, funnily enough, these learnable vectors, so you can imagine them if your language model operates on the space of 700 dimensions, you could simply learn a vector of 700 dimensions, but in fact, what they do rather is they parameterize it as an MLP that, for example, gets a fixed vector of size five, maps it to 100, and then maps it to 700 instead. Um, it's or like something like that. Um, and they write that this is more stable, which is really interesting. And yeah, if you extend this towards multiple uh, inputs, so prompts in the deep, um, domain, then it's called deep prompt tuning. And then for vision models, we had this one, if you remember, visual prompts. So you simply learn additional inputs in the RGB domain, um, works also for CNNs and only adapts in the input only domain, which is, of course, interesting because if you have things like GPT 3, you cannot really do deep prompts at all. Um, but what you can do is you can adapt in the input domain. So yeah, um, there's another work which sort of combines these and also does a bunch of analyses on what kind of um, prompts are useful for the vision domain because you can, yeah, you can simply learn additional prompts just like we do in the language domain. You can add these to the image prompts that you get. So in this case, each patch is a, is a token, right? And you can learn an additional uh, prompt that simply gets added to everything or you can add them as pixels, or you can concatenate. Uh, you can basically make a new channel for every image that gets learned. So there's a bunch of ways. Um, in the end, what they find what works best is simply learning an additional prompt. However, this paper uh, also trains a linear layer on top. So it's not only prompt learning, but also learning a linear layer. So that gives it a lot of flexibility. Um, another method which only does it in the input domain um, is sort of from a master's student of, of ours from last year, um, where the idea is basically, if this is a transformer that you're trying to adapt, where this one is take, stay, staying frozen, um, and you're not just learning these tokens per task. So for example, if you want to adapt the transformer to do cipher classification, you're not just learning these four vectors, but instead you're having this tiny network called prompt generator network, which takes a look at the image itself and outputs this um, this vector. So what you're doing is basically you're adapting, you're adapting the transformer not only to the domain but to the image itself, which is even more specialized. So it's an input to prompt mini network, um, and yeah, there's some some ways of how this actually gets done, such that it's more efficient. So because all of these prompt or adaptation methods care about efficiency, um, and then funnily enough. 
even though you're learning vectors, you can then map it back to the pixel space as well. And you get sort of similar similar looking outputs as, as a method from uh, Bank et al. Um, and uh, one interesting thing is that indeed what you can find is that if you have just the vision transformer, those clip, um, and if you look how good that is, that's 63%. If you just look at how good this model alone is, if you trained it supervisedly, that's 64%. But if you combine these two models in such a manner, then indeed you can achieve better performances, which shows basically that the PGN network um, learns exactly the stuff that's missing from the frozen clip model. So it learns how to help this clip model in a as well as possible. And it's oh yeah, and it's more robust um, than uh, linear probing. Um, these are not all the adaptation methods. There's these two libraries, PEFT and Adapted Transformers, which are uh, very well organized and which allow you to adapt transformers uh, very efficiently. Um, and you'll be also dealing with PEFT today, where you'll be uh, in the tutorial where you'll be adapting a, I think, 2.7 billion size transformer on a single GPU with those libraries. So these are very impressive developments, making fine tuning of even large language models possible. Right. I'll just briefly talk about other interesting developments, which is this segment anything model from Facebook AI, um, where they basically, and I'm going to just focus on the right hand side here. They have this sort of loop where they have a model which can annotate data, and then they use the data for training the model again. This is quite an interesting development. Um, and this annotation of the data is not done completely by the model itself, but there's rather some humans involved there. And they have the similar pipeline that we've also seen in some of the other papers where they start with very clean data. So for example, Blip also had this training cleaning pipeline, right? They start with clean data, then they use learn these filters where they figure out does this image match to the caption and so on. This is very similar. So they start with a very clean data set with 4.3 million masks from 120K images. This is roughly what we already have in computer vision. It's like, uh, for example, if you combine Coco and some other data sets, then they train a model and then they let this model loose on a larger data set of images. Then they have humans correct this. Um, and this, of course, very very, very expensive because you need very good human annotators to get good masks out. Um, and then finally, they they apply the model that was trained at this stage to 11 million images that they have licensed and that, which are freely available for download. And finally, only release the, the masks that were outputted by the model itself. So there's no human annotated masks in the final data set. And the, the sort of human annotated data, data set is in um, yeah, uh, you can get like the, the fun thing about this model is it can segment anything. So as the model says, you simply press a point, for example, in on the image, and then you'll get a mask corresponding mask out. It doesn't tell you what this mask is or what class it is or anything like that, but it simply gives you a mask. And this is already quite an interesting development, which will allow a lot of applications. And you can see these masks are extremely detailed and like extremely good and really shows like how far you can go if you invest a lot of money in supervision. Um, they also have some interesting fairness, fairness in AI related benchmarks where they show the, the, perf uh, the detection performance doesn't significantly alter with, for example, perceived age group or perceived gender presentation um, or perceived skin tone. Right. Um, I'll skip this part, but it's it's a very similar idea. It's sort of taking on, yeah, it's sort of combining this with in-context learning, where you're basically showing the in-context learning for vision, where you're showing the task. So for example, you're showing this image as well as the segmentation mask, and then you're giving it a new image, and then you're asking this model to then output the new image that corresponds to the solved task. So the idea here is that you, uh, that you change uh, typical vision tasks like segmentation all into image tasks. And that's why they call it a uh, painter model. Um, because lots of the vision tasks, for example, semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, key point detection, uh, depth uh, perception, where you're trying to get like, okay, how far is this wall versus that wall and so on. They can all be posed as image to image 
uh, methods. And so what they use is simply something like mask image modeling. So they take in the whole image and then they mask out a couple of um, target targets. And then you simply train it for outputting the target mask at that location. And then at inference time, you simply throw in the whole image and you try to get the whole uh, prediction out. Um, so this is essentially a combination of mask autoencoder and in-context learning, but for vision. And it's a, it's a really interesting idea as well. And then they have a new paper out, which also allows you to yeah, do some fine tuning for, for it's, it's basically prompt learning, um, how they fine tune it. All right, so that's, that's it for the lecture. We have four minutes to go. And uh, in today's tutorial, you'll be sort of playing around with a couple of things, like you'll be learning how to use OpenAI API, hugging face models, hugging face uh, PEF library for adapting language models. And you'll be basically, yeah, uh, building Socratic models. Um, so how to use these. And based on that, you can play around. Um, yeah. And Ivona and Mohammed will be there. So do ask them about the code. You can ask them about uh, in-context learning, um, all kinds of things, meta-learning. And yeah, so thanks for joining the lecture and enjoy.